question uh, for, you answer this in your head and your heart, okay? This question. Number one, um, if a person is truly saved in Jesus, truly saved, right now today, truly saved, is there a chance that some point in time later in your life, tomorrow or 30 years from now, you could lose your salvation? Just answer that in your head. You either answer yes or no. Truly saved in some point in time in the future, you, there's a chance you could lose that salvation. You answer that yes or no. Now, then the second question is, why did you answer the way you did? Now, a story. K2, it's called, in the Himalaya Mountains, is the second tallest mountain in the world, um, right next to Mount Everest. And in 1953, K2 was the tallest mountain that had never been climbed. And there was an American expedition that decided they wanted to do something about that. They were going to summit K2 for the first time. And they got so close that they were hit by a horrible, blinding snowstorm. I mean, they were tough. They, they stuck it out, hoping the weather would clear. They could make it to the top. They realized that was not going to happen. The situation became critical where they realized if we don't get off this mountain, if we don't descend down, we're not going to make it. So they began their descent down this icy, blinding snowstorm, steep mountain. And one of the climbers named George Bell, he slipped and he fell. And he began to rocket off the side of the mountain, sliding down that icy steep slope. His rope was attached to another climber. When George Bell fell off his feet, it pulled that second climber off his feet. And now you've got two of these climbers racing down the mountain on this steep, steep icy slope. It gets worse. Their rope got tangled with a rope attached to three more climbers. And now you have five climbers like out-of-control ragdolls, flying down the steep slope of this icy mountain, headed towards a vertical wall with a huge drop. They were facing certain death. At the end of all these climbers was 26-year-old Pete showing. Pete saw what was going on. He jumped up immediately, and he grabbed a rope that was attached to the ropes of the five guys going down the hill. And this is what he did. An artist sketched what he did in 1953. He took that rope that was attached to the falling climbers. He wrapped it around his waist. He took his wooden pickaxe and he dug it under a rock. And he wrapped the rope around himself, around the pickaxe, and around the rock. And he held on. And the weight of those climbers going down the hill, they, the weight hit him. The rope went tight, but it held. So they're at 27,000 feet in this blinding mountain snowstorm. Many today still consider it the greatest single feat that's ever happened in the history of mountain climbing. One guy, Pete Showing, was able to stop the fall of five of his friends and save their life. That story ties into the question I had you ask yourself just a minute ago. I believe it speaks to us about eternal security. You see, as God saved people, we're not perfect people. We will all struggle with sin until the time we're in heaven. The bottom line is our words, our thoughts, our actions. We all slip, we all fail, we all fall. But we don't go over the edge. We do not lose our salvation. See, in that story, they were tied with a rope to a man, a rock, and a wooden axe. Our salvation story, we are tied to our rock, Jesus, and to his wooden cross. And even though we slip and we fall and we fail, the one that we're tied to stands forever. Jesus saved us and he keeps us saved. The one we are tied to holds us and we will, he will never allow us to go over the edge and lose our salvation. Today we start a new three-part sermon series called Always. And we're talking about what some call the perseverance of the saints. Some call it eternal security. We're talking about what I believe as your pastor in 32 years of studying the Bible. I'm absolutely convinced of this. That if you are truly saved in Jesus, you can never, ever be lost again. We're going to see in this series and why it's important that if you're truly saved in Jesus... You're always saved in Jesus. That's where we get our title. Now, what we're going to do over these next three weeks, I want you to picture a wagon wheel. 
The hub, the round part of the wagon wheel, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to set the table and talk about some foundational biblical issues about what this means. Why do we believe that if you truly are saved in Jesus, it's forever? Why do we believe there's not a chance you could ever lose that? Why do we believe that? And why is it so important? And then if you've seen a wagon wheel, you've seen spokes come off the hub. We're going to look at eight spokes, eight truths, each of those truths, a different truth coming from a different angle where the Bible clearly teaches and shows us that if you are truly saved in Jesus, you're always saved in Jesus. We'll look at four next week and then four our last week. I would invite you to open your Bibles, if you would, to 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, or your Bible app. Welcome. So glad you're here. Online community, so glad you're with us. We love you being, being with us every single week. Grateful you're here. Now, this one verse, this is our text for the next three weeks. This is, if you will, uh, this is our launching pad for this series. This is the springboard that we're going to jump off of for the next three weeks about why we believe our denomination of 48,000 churches, our seminaries, why we hold this doctrinal truth that if you're truly saved in Jesus, it is forever and why it is important. And this is a key verse. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, the underlined portion. I did that for emphasis. It says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Very, very strong wording. The phrase, that you may know, it means this. There is not a shadow of doubt. There is absolute assurance and certainty that you know that you have, again, a super strong phrase that is saying you have a forever continual possession. It's not on again, off again. It's not you have it, then you don't have it. It is a forever continual possession. You put those two things together beyond a shadow of a doubt, you have absolute certainty that you have a forever continual possession of what? Eternal life. The word eternal means no end. The word eternal means our title. It literally means always. Eternal means always. It doesn't say conditional life. It doesn't say temporary life. It says that you can, without a shadow of a doubt, know for certain that you have a forever continual possession of this life without end, always not conditional, not temporary, but eternal life forever with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is our launching pad. The great Dr. Adrian Rogers, who's home with Jesus, he said it so clear. He said this, it is wonderful to be saved. Isn't it wonderful to belong to Jesus Christ? It's wonderful to be saved. It is wonderful to be saved and know that you're saved. There are people who always struggle with doubts, struggle with the assurance of their salvation. But it's a blessing to be, it's wonderful to be saved and to know you're saved. But look at that last one. It's wonderful to be saved. It's wonderful to know that you're saved. And folks, it's really wonderful to know that you can never lose your salvation. That's the all-time triple wonderful whammy right there. You're saying, oh, I see where this is going. This is that Baptist once saved, always saved thing. No, it's not a Baptist thing. It's a Bible thing. It's a Bible teaching. So as we jump into this series, let me be really clear. Man, I hear my heart on this. I fully know and realize that there are other followers of Jesus, my brothers and sisters in Christ, that I love. I love them. They love the Bible. They're students of the Bible. They study the Bible. They disagree with me. They think that you can lose your salvation. They think that it can be lost. I would never break fellowship. Love them. They're my brothers and sisters in Christ. They love the Bible as much as I love the Bible, but they disagree with me. They think that you can lose your salvation. I want to share that the purpose of this series is not to open the door to a theological debate or discourse about the topic of eternal security. I can't do that, and I won't do that. We have thousands of members in this church, thousands of people who are connected with us, and there's just no way that I, I could do That's not why I'm doing this. This isn't about starting a debate or some kind of a discourse. Hear me, I have studied the views. I know there are views that disagree with what I'm going to share with you these next three weeks. I have studied those views. I'm very familiar with those views, and I have respect, even though I disagree, for those who hold those views. The bottom line is this. You study and come to your own conclusions. 
Study and come to your own conclusions. I know those views. I've, I'm familiar with those views. I respect your right to have those views. What I'm saying is this. Don't send me your books, your articles, and your emails to prove your point of view. I'm familiar with it. You say, well, I think that is absolutely unfair. You get to stand in front of all these people for three weeks and share your view, and I don't get to share mine. I'm not stopping you from doing anything. Go get yourself a church and a pulpit and knock yourself out. That's not why I'm, do- I'm not doing this to open up some kind of debate. It's not why we're doing it. But I do believe that over these next three weeks, though not exhaustive, there's going to be so much here that you're going to be able to see not only what do I believe about this, but why do I believe it. And the bottom line, again, you study and come to your own conclusions. Four lessons for living. We're, it's the hub of the wagon wheel. We're setting the table about why, if you're truly saved, you're always saved. Number one, always saved, the truly saved. Always saved, the truly saved. Always saved. I picture yellow bags and yellow boxes from always saved. The group. That's, not, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the most important one, the spiritual one. Always saved, the truly saved. It says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, these things are written to you. Who? Who is it written to? Who believe in the name of the Son of God. He's writing to them about knowing that you have eternal life. He's writing to the truly saved. He's writing to someone who is already a believer in Jesus Christ. What does it mean to be truly saved? Who is the truly saved? Well, right there, 1 John 5, 13, scan your eyes up two more verses. And let's look at verses 11, 12, and 13 of 1 John chapter 5. Verse 11 says this, and this is the testimony that God has given. It's a gift we can't earn or deserve. He's given us eternal life, not conditional life, not temporary life, but eternal, forever life. And that this life is in his son. So to have eternal life is to have the son. Look at verse 12. He who has the son, Jesus, has life. He who does not have the son of God or he who does not have Jesus does not have life. You see, a person is not saved by coming forward in a church. A person is not saved by saying a prayer and signing a card. Salvation is not your name being on a church membership roll. Someone is not saved by taking some classes and being awarded a certificate. Salvation is not because you were raised in church. Salvation is not because you come from a family of followers of Jesus. Salvation is not that you believe that God is real and you do your best and try your best to be a good person, a good citizen, a good mom, a good dad, a good husband, a good wife, pays their bills. That's not salvation. Salvation is not being a religious person that goes to religious places, uses religious words, and does religious things. What is salvation? Salvation is what we see here in 1 John 5, 11, 12, and 13. In verse 13, it's those who have believed. They believe what the Bible says. They believe that we are far from God in our sin, separated from God. We believe that Jesus died on the cross to deliver us from our sin and from the wrath of God, that he died on the cross, he arose from the grave, and we have put our full weight down on that. We have trusted in Jesus and Jesus alone what he did on the cross. In verse 11, we not only we believe, but we received. Again, given that free gift of eternal life. We took that free gift of eternal life from Jesus. And then finally in verse 13 or verse 12, we have Jesus. We believe, we receive, we have Jesus. We have a personal relationship with him. We have the son. We are in Christ and Christ is in us. Does that describe you? Do you know that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior? That you admitted your sin, believed he died and rose again, and know that you need that. You turn to him in faith, have a personal relationship with him right now. So to be clear, these next three weeks... Eternal security is only for those who are truly believers, the truly saved. Not everyone who thinks they're saved and not everyone who says they're saved are truly saved. The Bible is clear. There are those who profess Jesus with their mouth, but they don't possess him in their heart. There are those who have an outward religious head belief about God, but they've never had an inward relationship for the forgiveness of sins with Jesus. We know that the Sermon on the Mount in in Matthew 7, Jesus talked about people coming to him saying, Lord, Lord, and he said, I never knew you. See, having an intellectual belief that there is a God does not save anyone. 
having an emotional response. It could be a deep emotional response. Man, there could be tears, whatever. There could be a deep emotional response to God. That does not mean salvation. We know that because what the Bible teaches us in James 2.19. It says, you believe there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. See, we see in this verse there is an intellectual belief in God. You believe that there is one God. There's an emotional response to God, you tremble. But this is an example of having an intellectual belief in God, an emotional response to God, but not being saved. You know why I know? Because there's not many demons in heaven. Critical verse about how it's only for the truly saved. About what do we mean, eternal security? 1 John 2, 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. This verse is teaching that there can be people who profess, people that are with you. They say they're saved. They say, yeah, I belong to Jesus, and maybe they're in church. Maybe they were baptized. But the Bible says there are those who have been with you that were never a part of you. They never were truly saved. So today, someone may, again, someone may say, yeah, are you a believer? Yeah, I'm saved in Jesus, was baptized, and go to church once in a while. But the bottom line is their life has never changed. They are the exact same person before they came to Christ as after Christ. They have no desire to pray, no desire to be in the Word, no desire to worship, no desire for lost people to know Jesus, no desire at all to be with God's people and fellowship with God's people. They're the same person they've always been. So you would say, okay, so you're telling me, Pastor Kenny, that that person did not lose their salvation. I'm telling you they did not lose their salvation. You know why? Because you can't lose what you never had. They were never saved to begin with. 1 John 2, 19, they were with us, but they were never part of us. There are right now today in this nation, national news stories, pastors, seminary professors, church leaders, deacons, who at one time served Jesus, preached the word of God, and now they've denied Jesus, and they even will tell you they're an atheist. They don't even believe there is a God anymore. From preaching Jesus every Sunday to saying I'm an atheist. Okay, Pastor Kenny, so you're telling me that person that used to preach, and now they're an atheist? You're telling me they didn't lose their salvation? Yeah, they didn't lose their salvation because you can't lose what you never had. They were never saved to begin with. Now, let's be clear. We as believers, we struggle with sin and will our entire life. Someone can be truly saved and be a backslidden believer. They can be backslidden from the Lord. They can have a distance. Their heart can grow cold towards the Lord. We see this in the life of David. We see it in the life of Samson. We see it in the life of Demas in the New Testament. We see it at the church of Corinth. So who is truly saved and who is the false believer? Only the Holy Spirit knows the heart of each person. Only the Holy Spirit knows my heart. But I promise you, the Holy Spirit will let every heart know. Because in Romans 1, no one has an excuse. No one will be able to say, crud, I didn't know. No one will have an excuse. But I know this, if someone is truly saved, regardless of how much they may sin or backslide in their life, Jesus said in John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast them out. For you, is it real? Are you saved? Eternal security is only for the truly saved, and you can never lose what you never had. Number two, we're just setting the table here. Number two, always saved. Some disagree. Some disagree. 1 John 5, 13 says that I, you've been given eternal life. You know that you have eternal life. There are some people, again, who love Jesus and believe the Bible. They say no, that eternal life can stop. They're saying that there is a chance sometime that you could truly be saved and you could lose your salvation. A little side note, in 32 years of preaching, I've never met someone who believed they could lose their salvation who said that they lost their own. It's always somebody else who can lose their salvation. So why do some people believe that you can lose your salvation? There's basically two views. There are those who believe that you can deny Jesus and walk away from him and you'll lose your salvation. There are those, number two, who believe you can sin against Jesus and he walks away from you. 
Well, the first view that, yeah, you can be saved and lose your salvation if you deny Jesus and walk away from him. This thought is, well, you chose Jesus to get saved. You can refuse Jesus and walk away from him. And they'll say, man, there's been people who deny Jesus, who say they don't believe the Bible anymore. You tell me they're still saved. No, 1 John 2, 19, we just studied it. They never were saved in the first place. They've never been saved. But there can be believers, truly saved people. Maybe it's persecution. Man, they're on a foreign mission field, and it's hard. Maybe it's the suffering and sorrows of life. Maybe it's the cares of the world. They just got so wrapped up in all this junk, they've distanced themselves from Jesus. Truly saved. Maybe it's their own selfish, sinful decisions. But they can be what's called backslidden. They can be away from the Lord and doing more what self wants and the world wants. They don't need to be saved again. They need to repent. They didn't lose their salvation. In Revelation chapter 2, we see the church of Ephesus. In Acts 13, we see John Mark who walked away from the Lord. He didn't need to get saved again. He needed to repent and return to the Lord. The greatest example is the apostle Peter himself. Jesus is going to the cross, not once, not twice. What did Peter do three times concerning Jesus? He denied him. Did Peter need to get saved again from denying Jesus? No. He needed to repent and return, which is what he did. The second view of how you can lose your salvation is you sin against Jesus and he walks away from you. So you truly are saved in Jesus and you sin and you sin and then you sin some more and then you sin and then you sin and finally God says, that's it, you're out. The issue is at what point does that happen? At what point do I do so bad that God says you're out? At what point do I not do enough good that God says I'm out? And where is any of that in the Bible? God is 100% sinless and holy 100% of the time. A microspeck of sin in my life, a word, a thought, one tiny little microspeck of sin is as glaring to the holy God of the universe as the noonday sun. Plus, if I believe my sin can cause God to walk away from me, Jesus walk away from me, I'm in trouble because the Bible says as believers we still sin. And you know it. You, you know none of us are perfect people. The Bible tells us in 1 John 1, 8, to believers, if we say we have no sin, we lie. So when does a, a truly saved person cross the sin line and they're no longer saved? Is it one sin? Is it 10 sins? Is it 43 sins? Are we saying that God's, there's a degree of sin that's more worse towards God than another sin? Are we saying that your sin pile can get so big that after a while God just says you're out, you're no longer saved? If I could not do a single good work to save me, how many bad works do I got to do to be unsaved? And it's not in the Bible anywhere. Nowhere in the Bible is someone born again, then unborn again, then born again, then unborn again. Nowhere in the Bible is someone adopted to God's family, then unadopted to God's family. Nowhere in the Bible are you a sheep part of his flock and he kicks you out and you become a goat. Nowhere in the Bible are you part of the body of Christ and then you get amputated from the body. Nowhere in the Bible do you become the bride of Christ and then Jesus divorces you. Nowhere in the Bible are you set free and then all of a sudden the chains are slapped back on your wrist. Nowhere in the Bible does Jesus purchase you and then later he takes you back to the return desk. It's not there. On the cross, Jesus suffered, bled, and died to wipe out all our sins. It makes no sense that we later could sin and wipe out Jesus and his cross. If you believe you can truly be saved and there's a chance sometime you could lose your salvation, okay, say you lose your salvation, what's next? Can you never be saved again? Is it a one-shot deal? Or is your spiritual life like a, like a salvation tennis match? Lost saved, lost, saved, lost, saved. 324 times you've been lost and you've been saved and you better hope the day you draw your last breath you're not having a bad day because you're in trouble. Also, to think I can be saved, I'm truly saved, I sin, 
I lose my salvation in love is to not understand the doctrine of salvation in the New Testament. It doesn't understand justification. It doesn't understand sanctification. It doesn't understand glorification. It really doesn't understand that on the cross, when Jesus said it is finished, he died for all past, present, and future sins. Some people disagree with the topic of eternal security. They say you shouldn't teach it. I shouldn't preach this series because it's very dangerous. This is a dangerous series. Well, first of all, truth is never dangerous. The Bible's never dangerous. Truth is what's needed. But here are two reasons why people say you shouldn't have spend three weeks on this topic. It's too dangerous. One is this. There's the view that this is not a good topic. It's a dangerous topic because of this. Someone could really be lost, but you could give them a false confidence that they are saved, and then they would never be saved. It's dangerous. They're truly lost, but they think, well, I'm always saved. If you believe that this is dangerous because someone who's truly lost could have a false confidence and never be saved, wow, you need to majorly adjust your view of the power of the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God to convince and convict people of their sins from a loving God who wants none to perish and all to be saved. And again, Romans 1, no one has an excuse. Second view is this, why this is dangerous. Because it basically teaches Christians this. I can be saved and sin all I want. I can be saved and be lazy and not serve God. If you're saved and you're going to heaven, who cares about church? Who cares about missions? I'll just go do whatever I want to do because I'm in. If someone believes that, that in itself is a red flag that they've never been saved. Dr. Rogers again, if somebody says, well, if I believed in once saved, always saved, I'd get saved and sin all I want to. Dr. Rogers said, friend, you're looking at a man who sins all he wants to. I sin more than I want to. I don't want to sin. If you have the idea that you can get saved and then you'd sin all you want to, you have have a kind of sinning religion then you don't know the Bible, you don't know the Lord, and you don't know Jesus. You get saved, and you get your wanter fixed, mister. As a matter of fact, you get a brand new wanter. It doesn't just fix it, he gives you a brand new one. To think that it's dangerous to say, if you teach eternal security, it gives Christians the freedom to sin all they want to with no consequences. Again, in love, you are neglecting the clear doctrine in Hebrews 12 of God disciplining his children. Where a truly saved person, God's child, if they are willfully thinking, I'm just going to sin all I want to, God loves us so much, he disciplines his children. He, he'll bring conviction, he'll bring discipline, even to the point the Bible teaches, rather than God saying, you're going to lose your salvation and go to hell, God says, I'm going to call you home to me. He even disciplines to the point his children, they lose their physical life and die. We know that from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the abuse of the Lord's Supper. We know that from Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. His discipline. You don't sin and get away with it. Donna and I were at a big lot store. Let me just say, um, anyway, we were at a big lot store, and we were waiting in the checkout line, and there, this is years ago, and there was this little boy in, sitting in the, the, you know, the cart in front of us, and they had the candy hanging right there by the cash register, and they had those gooey... Um, orange slices, the big orange slices. Man, that little guy's face lit up. He grabbed some of those orange slices. He was as happy as he could be. He was hugging it. He had him some candy. Mom was super nice, but she took it away from him and says, honey, you can't have it, and hung it back up. And oh my, did he lose it. He said, I want my thing. I want my thing. I I mean, you can hear him in the whole store just screaming, crying. I want my thing. I want my thing. She was so embarrassed. She hurried up and paid. And as they went out the door, big lots, I want my thing. I want my thing. We paid for our stuff, bagged it up, walked outside. And they were backing out in the minivan with the windows up. And you could hear, I want my thing. I want my thing. (laughs) Full disclosure, my thought was this. Buddy, if I was your dad, it'd take me about five seconds to give you your thing, okay? <laughs> I want, I'm, honestly, I wanted to discipline him. You know why I didn't discipline him? He's not my kid. 
And if someone says they're saved and they live a life of sin and there's no discipline in their life at all for willfully sinning, it means they've never been saved. They're not his kid. But if someone truly is saved and they willfully are living in sin, God's patient. It may be conviction. It may be discipline. Even to the point of their physical death, God will discipline his children. My goodness, what type of father do we think God is? He is the sort of father that lovingly disciplines his children. He is not the sort of father that would disown his children. He'll take them to heaven before he would let them be lost and die and go to hell. Number three, always save the scriptures. What about those verses in the Bible that seem to say you can lose your salvation? What about those verses? I can explain Bible verses that seem to teach salvation can be lost by placing those verses in one of five categories. Hang with me here. We can do this. Believers losing reward. The category of believers not living like the lost. The category of identifying counterfeit Christians. The category of endurance is a mark of the truly saved. And the category of God disciplines his carnal Christians. Hang with me. You're doing great. Let me give you examples of those. There are some Bible passages that's not teaching the loss of salvation. Some people use those verses and say, look, it's teaching you can be lost. No, it's not. It's teaching believers lose reward. An example, 1 Corinthians 3.15, if any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, as yet through fire. It's not teaching you lose your salvation. It's teaching that believers at the judgment seat of Christ can lose reward. There are Bible passages that's not teaching the loss of salvation, but they're challenging believers not to live like the lost. And if an example is this, Ephesians 5, 1 through 7. That some people say, look, those verses are teaching you can lose your salvation. I say, no, they're not. They're teaching us as believers not to live like the lost. Three, there are Bible passages that's not teaching us the loss of salvation, but they're identifying counterfeit Christians. 2 Peter 2 is a great example, talking about false believers. And that's where Peter said a dog returns to his vomit. He's not talking that believers lose their salvation. He's saying this person was never saved in the first place, and because they don't have a new nature, it proves it. In Acts 1.25, talking about Judas. Judas was followed Jesus, heard every sermon saw every miracle. It's not teaching in Acts 1.25 that Judas lost his salvation. Judas was never saved to begin with. He was a fake, false, counterfeit Christian. Number four, there are Bible passages that are not teaching the loss of salvation, but how endurance is the mark of the truly saved. An example of this is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 2. People will use that passage and say it teaches you can lose your salvation. Because it says, you also were saved if you hold fast that word I preached to you unless you believed in vain. It's saying, see, it says you got to hold fast or you believed in vain. No, it's not talking about losing salvation, I believe. It's talking about endurance, continuing with Christ. That endurance doesn't save us, doesn't keep us saved. We are not perfect people. We can backslide, be away from the Lord, fail, fall, all those things. But it's teaching in this passage, the mark of the truly saved is that there's this continuance in your heart of knowing Jesus and wanting to follow him. Then finally, the fifth one, this is the Bible passages that are not teaching the loss of salvation, but how God disciplines carnal believers. It's Hebrews 6, 4 through 10. Hebrews 6, 4 through 10 is probably the most common passage of scripture used to say you can lose your salvation. I don't believe it's teaching you can lose your salvation. It's a very, very difficult passage. Verse 4 of Hebrews 6, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift, have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the ages to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him in open shame. Verse 9, But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you, yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, and that you have ministered to the saints to do ministry. Tough passage of scripture. Who is it talking about? There's three options. Option number one is it's talking about a believer who lost their salvation. If you believe that Hebrews 6, 4 through 10 is teaching the saved can be lost, then you can't take half this verse. You've got to take all the verse. Because it says in verse 4, it's impossible in verse 6 once they fall away to renew them again. If you believe this teaches you lose your salvation, then it's also teaching you can never, ever be saved again. It's a one-shot deal. You've got to take the whole verse. It says you can never renew them. 
Some people say, no, it's talking about unbelievers. It's someone that the Holy Spirit grabbed their heart, and they had conviction of the gospel, and they were really close to getting saved, but then they rejected Jesus, that this whole passage is telling unbelievers a warning to them, don't reject Jesus. I mean, it could be that. I believe it's the third option. It's talking to the truly saved about living like a carnal Christian. It's talking about a believer who is living in sin. They are backslidden. They're away from the Lord, and they are losing their witness. They will lose their reward, and they could even possibly lose their life. I believe it teaches that because the key's in verse 9. It says, beloved, that's believers, things that accompany salvation. It's talking about things that accompany our salvation, but in verse 6, it says you fall away. The Bible doesn't say you fall away from salvation. I believe it's teaching a believer falls away from the good grace of God in their life. We just talked about it. They are experiencing God's discipline. They lose their witness, lose their reward, and could even lose their life. The bottom line is this. Hang with me now. If you really believe the Bible is God's word, I believe the Bible is God's word, we've got to deal with this, okay? We've got to know why we believe what we believe. There are clearly some verses who seem to say you can lose your salvation, But there are all these other verses that clearly, clearly teach that you can't lose your salvation. What do we do with that? You and I have only three options. Here's your three options. One, you have to believe the Bible contradicts itself. That both are in the Bible and the Bible contradicts itself. Well, if the Bible contradicts itself, we're all in big trouble. Two, you must explain, if you believe salvation can't be lost, then you have to explain the handful of verses that seem to teach salvation can be lost. I can do that by putting them in those five categories. Or if you believe you can lose your salvation, here's what you've got to do. If you don't believe the Bible contradicts itself, you've got to explain the many verses that clearly teach salvation cannot be lost. 1 John 5.13 says eternal life. 32 times in the New Testament associated with salvation, the Bible says we're giving eternal, forever, no end life. If you can lose your salvation in 10 minutes or in 10 years, it's not eternal life. It's conditional life. It's temporary life. And you have to explain those 32 verses, how that can say what it says, and you can still lose your salvation. You have to explain the eight different angles I'm going to show the next two weeks that talk about how you can truly lose your salvation. It's got to be one of the three. Here's, I believe, the good principle for us. When it comes to the Bible, always interpret cloudy verses by clear verses. Hebrews 6, 4 through 10 is difficult. But if I've got 32 verses that says eternal life, you'll never perish, never snatch them out of my hand. You'll be with me in heaven forever. I interpret the obscure verse by the obvious verse. I interpret the cloudy verse by the clear verse. The Bible gives such detail, such detail about how to get saved. Don't you think the Bible would give just as much clear detail about how to lose your salvation? Isn't it that important? It's not there. You study and come to your own conclusions. And don't send me your book because I won't read it. Always saved importance. I just don't have time. That's not why I'm doing this. I'm not trying to make some big debate here. Importance. Why is this important anyway? Am I just trying to prove some Baptist doctrinal point? How does this impact your alarm going off tomorrow at 8 o'clock? How does this impact what you're facing in your life right now? Why is this important? Well, it's important, 1 John 5, 13, because God wants us to know. So it must be important. I mean, think about it with me. Man, this is huge. God made a big promise, eternal life. Does God deliver on his promise? Is my connection to Jesus breakable or unbreakable? If I belong to Jesus, do I live with eternal security or eternal insecurity? As God's saved person, is my place in heaven certain or is it uncertain? Let me tell you why it's important, why this series is important. Number one, it's important to our view of salvation. How do you truly see salvation? We either see salvation by grace or by works. If you believe that you can truly be saved, and then sometime in the future, there's a chance of losing your salvation. You do not believe in salvation by grace. You believe in salvation by works. 
In other words, Jesus may do enough to get you saved, but it's up to you to keep yourself saved. Folks, there's three options when it comes to salvation. Either I'm faithful, either God and myself are faithful, or either it's based on God being faithful. Let me tell you what it is. It's based on God being faithful. To believe you can lose your salvation, you do not believe in salvation by grace. You believe in salvation by works. You've got to keep yourself saved. It's important. It's important to our view of having a life of a growing faith. How can I truly trust God in all the craziness of life, and how can I have a passion to become more like Jesus if I honestly never for sure know where I stand with him today or tomorrow? It's important to us, an important topic, our view of God's love. Is God's love for me conditional based upon who I am and what I do and what kind of day I'm having? Or is God's love for me unconditional based upon him and who he is and what Jesus did for me? Because Romans 8 says nothing can separate me from his love. Well, if I can lose my salvation, I'm separated from his love. It's important, important for God's mission. The Great Commission. How can I have a fire to go to someone and tell them that God wants to give them eternal life when I honestly don't know for sure if I'm always going to have eternal life? If I believe I can lose my salvation, then I need to share the gospel like this. I don't need to tell anyone we're offering you good news. I need to say we're offering you possible good news. And if you hang with it all your life, it will be good news. Why is it important? How else can we have a life of comfort, confidence, joy, and peace? The Bible says in Philippians 4, 6, it's a command to believers, be anxious for nothing. How in the world can I live out that verse if when my head hits my pillow at night, I'm not 100% sure where I'm going to land? I'm like a guy going off the steep, icy slope of K2. If I'm not sure I'm saved, I'm not safe. There's no peace in that. I always ask my family if I can share stories. I never dive bomb my family and my kids that I could share the story. This, I want you to picture this with me. There's a blanket in the middle of the living room floor spread out, and in the middle of that blanket, there are toys. There's some stuffed animals and these brightly colored plastic toys. Those toys happen to be the favorite toys of my daughter, Lauren, who at this time is a little over a year old and just wobbly learning to walk pretty decent. Picture with me that one corner of the blanket is behind a chair in the living room, and also hidden behind that chair is Lauren's seven-year-old brother, Dustin, who's got both hands on the corner of the blanket. This is Dustin's plan. Pretty ingenious, I would say. He knows Lauren's going to walk into the living room and see all of her favorite toys on the blanket. She's going to smile. They're irresistible. She's going to wobble and walk over to the toys in the middle of the blanket, and at just the right moment, with all of his strength that a seven-year-old boy has, he's going to yank it hard and fast and pull that blanket out from under her. And that's exactly what he did. She crashed. She cried. He went yes and laughed. And Mom and I, well, I want my thing. We did our thing, okay? It wasn't a good day for Dustin. I want you to imagine. He is creative. I'll give him that. I want you to imagine you're Lauren. We're just about done. I want you to imagine you're Lauren. What it must be like when what you're standing on is totally pulled out from under you. If you believe you can lose your salvation, you can truly be saved, and at some point in time lose your salvation, you have no spiritual stability. There's even a chance you could lose it someday. You have nothing to stand on. You are taking God's love and pulling it out from under you. You are taking the gospel of grace and pulling it out from under you. You're taking the great commission and the passion for our mission. You're pulling it out from under you. You're taking a life, whatever this world throws of us, of confidence and comfort and peace and joy, and you're pulling it out from under you. And I'm so glad that what we have learned today based upon the Bible, and I'm so glad what we're going to learn together these next two weeks, I hope you can be here, is this. Folks, nothing can pull our salvation out from under us. Nothing. The truly saved are always saved. Would you bow your heads with me?